I rise to put the leadership of the House, the Senate, and the President of the United States on notice. I will not consent to any expedited passage of any spending bill that provides any more American aid to Ukraine. It's as if no one has noticed that we have no extra money to send to Ukraine. Our deficit this year will exceed $1.5 trillion. Borrowing money from China to send it to Ukraine makes no sense. It's not as if we have some sort of rainy day fund sitting around trillions of dollars at a pot of money and we're just going to send that to Ukraine. We're going to borrow it. When we borrow it and create new money to pay for that borrowing, we create the inflation that is plaguing our economy. Since the beginning of Russia's war in Ukraine, the American taxpayers provided Ukraine with $113 billion. Over the 583 days of war, between February 24, 2022 and the end of the month, that averages $6.8 billion per month or $223 million per day. There's a lot of things that we need to fix in our country before we borrow money to try to perpetuate a war in another country. When will the aid requests end? When will the war end? Can someone explain what victory in Ukraine looks like? President Biden certainly can't. His administration has failed to articulate a clear strategy or objective in this war, and Ukraine's long-awaited counteroffensive has failed to make meaningful gains in the East. With no clear end in sight, it looks increasingly like Ukraine will be yet another endless quagmire funded by the American taxpayer. That's why public support for the war is waning. A CNN poll from August shows that a majority of Americans now oppose Congress authorizing additional funding to Ukraine. And now there are those in the Senate who would refuse to listen to these voices, voices coming from a war-weary nation, and who would hold the federal government hostage by inserting $24 billion more for Ukraine. They're talking about saying the only way government stays open, the only way we avoid a shutdown is by shoveling more American taxpayer dollars to Ukraine. They're going to link keeping the government open with more money to Ukraine, and I'm here to say that I'm not going to agree to it, and I will not let them shut down the government simply because they want to send more of your hard-earned tax dollars to Ukraine. Either the American people fund an endless war in Ukraine, or the Uniparty threatens to shut down the government. This is a clear dereliction of duty, and I will not stand for it. Colleagues, as representatives of the American people, you should not stand for it either. The bill that comes for us should be about funding our government, not somebody else's government. I will not give consent to a bill that includes funding for Ukraine in keeping our government open. As elected officials, we have an obligation to pursue a foreign policy that advances the security and prosperity of our country funneling billions of dollars that have to be borrowed into the meat grinder of eastern Ukraine does neither. The longer this conflict continues, the greater the risk that miscalculation or purposeful escalation draws the United States into direct conflict with Russia. Russia's military may have a bloody nose, but Moscow still maintains the largest nuclear arsenal in the world Let's not pretend that the U.S. involvement in this war comes without risks. If that's not bad enough, we lack effective oversight mechanisms to ensure that the hard-earned American tax dollars don't fall prey to waste, fraud, and abuse. For over a year now, I have been asking for a special inspector general to make sure they're not stealing our money. We've had one in Afghanistan, and, he is, and his team of economists and technicians have overseen and found billions of dollars worth of waste that they've saved. We need the same thing in Ukraine, a special inspector general to make sure they're not stealing our money. When that has come before a vote in the Senate, the majority party in here says, no, we just want to spend the money. We don't care. Some Republicans have gone along with this as well, and they have voted against an inspector general. It is a terrible abuse of our spending authority to spend money overseas in a war and not make sure that they're not stealing it. 
So in addition to the colossal cost of the war, we end up paying a corruption tax. Ukraine is one of the most corrupt countries on the planet, maybe second only to Russia. Corruption runs deep in Ukraine, and there's plenty of evidence that it has run rampant since Russia's invasion. As President Zelensky landed in New York earlier this week, we learned that corruption concerns in Ukraine's Ministry of Defense resulted in the firing of six deputy defense ministers. This comes two weeks after the firing of Defense Minister Oleksiy Reznikov, who was removed after it was discovered that the Ministry of Defense had mishandled military contracts. Last month, Zelensky fired all 24 regional military recruitment chiefs because they were, quote, involved in illegal activities, including enrichment. Last October, we learned that U.S. shipment of grenade launchers, machine guns, rifles, bulletproof vests, and thousands of rounds of ammunition were ending up in the hands of criminal gangs and weapons traffickers posing as humanitarian organizations. And what did the Senate do? They voted against a special inspector general to make sure they're not stealing our money. What are we doing? Is this fair? Millions of Americans are struggling each day to make ends meet. Millions of Americans are struggling to provide for their families and put food on the table. Can we honestly look our constituents in the eye and tell them that there is a, this is a good investment of their dollars? Some say the war in Ukraine is a fight to save democracy. But those who say that need to be honest with themselves. Ukraine is far from a shining example of democracy. And while the strain of war can make for questionable government actions, we have to live with them when the war is over. For all the platitudes about America supporting democracy and making the world safe for democracy, the Woodrow Wilson advocates among us, the biggest recipient of American welfare, Ukraine, canceled its next presidential election. You're telling me we're sending $100 billion to a country that's not going to have elections? We're going to send $100 billion to a country that now has, what, a president for life? I say, oh, well, we could, but it's difficult. Does anybody remember the American Civil War where 600,000 people died and yet we didn't miss an election? They've canceled the presidential election. We should cancel our aid as a response. This is not the only concerning development in Ukraine. Despite Zelensky's charm offensive this week, his actions also deserve scrutiny. Citing national security concerns, Zelensky has banned Orthodox churches oriented towards the Russian Orthodox Church and has ordered Ukrainian law enforcement to raid churches and arrest priests. He has banned the political opposition. How do you have a democracy if you're not going to have elections and you banned the opposition? He suspended 11 political parties, including the opposition, plat opposition platform for life, the second largest party in Ukraine's parliament and the one which held 44 seats. He has attacked free speech by banning opposition media and increasing his government's regulatory power over journalists. Hardly sounds democratic to me. Earlier this year, he signed into law a bill that allows Ukraine's State Broadcasting Council to regulate all media in Ukraine. The council can impose mandatory orders, fines, restrict content from search engines, and even outright suspend media outlets without a court decision. Hardly sounds very Democrat to me. If you wish these actions that sound like the actions of authoritarian regime, if you suspect these do sound like an authoritarian reason, regime, you're right. This past July, a Swiss intelligence report observed, quote, authoritarian traits in Zelensky as he tries to push the mayor of Kiev, Vitaly Klitschenko, Klitschenko out of contention for Ukraine's 2024 presidential elections. Citing martial law, Zelensky stated that those elections will not take place. Martial law, no elections, banning opposition party. This is where your $100 billion has gone, and they're not done. We don't have the money. The money's being borrowed. We borrow the money from China to send it to Ukraine. In 2021, Zelensky fired multiple government officials, including his prime minister, for investigating a Ukraine oligarch who just happened to be a key backer of Zelensky's presidential campaign. The United States placed sanctions on this oligarch for his involvement in significant corruption, 
And earlier this month, he was finally arrested. Clearly, Ukraine and the regime are not paragons of democracy. But this is not just about what Ukraine is or is not with respect to government. This is about American interests and our national security. Every day this war continues is another spin of the roulette wheel with another chance of it stopping on Armageddon. And we are paying for the privilege. We cannot continue with business as usual. We cannot continue to put the needs of other countries above our own. We cannot save Ukraine by dooming the U.S. economy. And we certainly cannot save Ukraine by fighting a war with Russia. As we go further and further into debt, we become weaker. It's not just that this is not helping our national security. The very threat to our national security is our debt. The more we send money overseas, the more we deplete our munitions, the worse things get. No matter how sympathetic we are to the Ukrainian people, we must put the American people first. And to that end, I encourage my colleagues to oppose any effort to hold the federal government hostage for Ukraine funding. Thank you, Mr. President, and I yield the floor.